Good morning, everyone, and happy Lord's Day. It's good to have you here today, and welcome to this presentation from the International Baptist Church. We're glad that you chose to tune in, whether you're using your TV, your computer at home, whatever it may be, even your telephone. Uh, thank you for choosing to listen to this broadcast of God's Word, and thank you for just being um, loving toward God. You know, I miss you all so badly. Those of you who are our church members and church family, I, I miss you so much. I, I miss seeing your faces. I, I miss hearing your voices. I just miss you, and I, I hope the feeling is mutual because when we go through these times, these stressful, uh, uneasy, strange times, uh, uh, in some of my emails back and forth from some pastors, we tell you this is some strange times we're going through, but we all know that this time will pass. This will, will go through this, and God is with us. We'll go out on the other side. Things will get better. Things will not maybe get back to the normal that we know, but we will get back to some type of normal. Whatever that new normal may be will be better than we are now. Because remember this, we are God's children. No matter what the world does, no matter what is going on in this world, if we truly have faith in Jesus Christ, we know him as our Lord and Savior. We're his children. And it's only by faith, not because of good works, not because we're special, but we believe in him. So please, please, I beseech you, please continue to trust God. Trust God and keep praying for each other. We need to be steady in our prayer. We need to be strong in our study of his word. We need to be strong together because this will pass. I have faith and I believe you do too. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this ability to send out this message, Lord, uh, over the airways and through all the different types of media. Lord, thank you, Lord, that this is a privilege and honor that we have. Thank you for the people who tune in, who want to hear your word. Lord, bless those who hunger and thirst for your word, that they hunger and thirst for you. May they be filled, Lord. May you give them what they need, Lord, and what they want. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege and honor to just be, Lord, your people. For we know, Lord, you are with us no matter where we are. You are with us. You are our God. And we lift you up. We want to worship you in whatever way we possibly can because you are our God. Please accept this worship. Accept this, Lord, as a sacrifice from your people. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Okay, let me give you some announcements. Services will continue to be canceled through April, all the way through the rest of this month. Well, this year's going by pretty fast, so that's only one more Sunday we're going to do this. Right now, the plan is starting May the 3rd. May the 3rd, which is the first Sunday in May, we will start having limited services again. The plan is to go back and have Sunday morning services only. No fellowship, no PM service, no afternoon service, and no Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday night Bible study. Now that schedule will probably continue at least through May. And if things change, we will let you know. Our Sunday morning services, though, will be conducted as best as we can under all CDC and governmental guidelines in order to limit the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, which means we will try to maintain our best of our ability, six-foot separation between every person. You know... 
On our regular services, we have 50 to 60 people. There's room for 150 people in this sanctuary, so we have enough room. There's enough room to come and worship with us and sing and praise God and hear God's word face to face to hear and worship together. There is enough room. So please, come. Please come. This should not keep us, this situation that we're going through now should not keep us from worshiping God. We may be wearing face masks. In fact, I ask you when you come, starting May the 3rd, to wear a face mask. Don't worry. Even with your face mask, I will know who you are. Not only that, God will know who you are. Even better than me. So don't worry. Wear your face mask. Come here on May the 3rd and worship God. 11 o'clock. It'll be our regular worship service time. That is May the 3rd. Now realize that things could change because there's not a final thing out there. Things could change. Things could get worse. So we're going to be a little bit fluid, be, be able to change. But right now the plan is May the 3rd we'll have our first full service, okay? That's only in two weeks from now. And unless things are getting better, you know, I, I hear good news. Now you may hear the bad news out there because you're always going to hear that there's always people who look at the bad side and want to talk about the bad things but again we need to trust God and use good common sense so I'm a firm believer that the government is allowing us CDC is allowing us that we can be smart we can wear our face mask we can come and keep our separation and we can worship God so please I beg you May the 3rd, return to church and worship God. It will be different, I know. It'll be a different type of service. For those of you who came to our last service before they were canceled, it would be very similar to that. But we will be singing. We will be praising God. I will be preaching. We will be worshiping. Different though it may be, we will be worshiping. So please remember that and continue to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now let us go to the Lord in prayer. Mighty God in heaven, we humble ourselves before you because Lord God, you are our God. There is no other, Lord, and we know that you are holy and righteous. We know that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. We know, Lord, that you made us, Lord, and yet, Lord, we have sinned. We have failed you, but you provided a way, and his name is Jesus. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Holy One of God, Lord, and we humble ourselves in your name, for, Lord, you make this possible. We come to worship. May your spirit be with us, Lord. May your spirit lead us and guide us. May we feel your presence. No matter where we are, Lord, may we come into your presence, for you are God. Even those that are home, those that are outside, almighty God, please let us worship you. We want to humble ourselves before you. We want to be your people. We want to worship you, though the times are strange, though many things are going on. You are still God, and you're still in control. And we believe that, Lord. We believe it because it is true. You are our God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Thank you for being the God that you are. Thank you that you've called us and made us your people. Have mercy on us, Lord, and forgive us. Forgive us where we have rebelled and gone astray. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Let us come into your presence now. It doesn't matter where we are. We know that you are with us, Lord. You are our God, and we humble ourselves before you now. Say, Lord, please. Please have mercy on us. Please hear our sacrifice. Please hear us, Lord. We call out to you for your namesake, Lord. Let our worship be sincere and from our hearts. 
May all we do and say be pleasing to you. May we give you all the glory and all the honor. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Everyone, please stand with me. Let's stand and give God glory. Let's lift him up and worship him. Repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Those of you that stood, please be seated. Again, I hope that your neighbors heard you singing out there and yelling at your houses, in your apartments, wherever you are. I hope that your neighbors were coming, knocking on your door, saying, what's going on? And you said, I'm worshiping God. You want to join me? Come on in and listen to this message. Because I pray that this message is from God. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, please, with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verses 15 through 19 is what we're looking at this morning. That's Isaiah 63, 15 through 19. Please follow along as I read. Look down from heaven and see from your lofty throne, holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your might? Your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. But you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. Why, O oh Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. For a little while your people possessed your holy place, but now our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary. We are yours from of old, but you have not ruled over them. You have not been called by your name. They have not been called by your name. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this, your word. Thank you, Lord, for this message. Thank you, Lord, that people hear it all over the place. Not only here in this place, but even in those homes. In those places, may your word accomplish your good and perfect will. May your people draw near to you through your word. May we remember, Lord, that you are our Father and we are your people. Let your spirit anoint us. Let your spirit, Lord, guide us. May, Lord, what we do and say be pleasing to you. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. This morning, we're talking about God, our Father. He is our Father. Isaiah had just described some of the past experiences with God when he moved on. He moved on and he acted on the behalf of his people. Isaiah, after he's did this, he says, I need to speak to you, God. And now he prays to God. He prays to God to remember that he is their father. He is their father. It's a prayer caused out of their sorrow and what their assumed desertion. They deserted God, and yet they're still calling out to him. Because you see, it is a call. It's a call for merciful intervention. It's a call for their God of power and their God of love. To take action on their part, on their behalf. In spite, in spite of the fact that their rebellion had caused God to turn against them, guess what? They are still his people. God's the one that made them his people. They didn't make themselves his people. God made them 
his people. God did it, so therefore they're calling out to the God saying, Look, God, we are your people. You made us your people. Please hear us. That's what they placed their trust in. They placed their trust in the fact that God was their father. So let's look at these words. Our redeeming father. Verse 15 is a plea for God's presence and God's activity in the lives of the people. Look down from heaven and see from your lofty throne, holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your might? Your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. The heavens, you know, reveal the glory of God. The earth reveals the glory of God. We look at nature outside. We look at the trees. We hear the birds singing. We see the sun. We see so many wonderful, great things that declare the glory of God, His presence. And His glory is seen in His position over the universe that He created. His glory is also revealed, though, in His mighty deeds. The things he does. Back in Isaiah 40, verse 5, it says, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God created his people. And he created his people to bring him glory. To bring him glory in their actions and in their noble character. He created us and gave us faith that we may glorify him in how we live, how we act, how we are set apart, how we are different from the world. God's glory is experienced by his people in his presence as they worship him. In fact, God's word tells us very clearly that God is inhabits the praises of his people. The lament here, the prayer, the the concern is that God's zeal for his people and his mighty miracles on their behalf appear to be gone. He's saying, God... Where are you? What's wrong? Why have you deserted us? He seems far away. He seems far away up in heaven. It seems like he he doesn't have any concern for us, his people anymore. It's like he doesn't care. Even the, the feelings and compassion of his heart seem to be not moved by their present condition. Because our sin has distanced them from God, he no longer seems willing to help the sinner return to himself, who is the good shepherd. We are his sheep, but he seems not to care. Maybe you too In these times of trials, these times of difficulty, uncertainty, not knowing what tomorrow holds, maybe we're afraid. Maybe we're experiencing some of the same feelings that these people were. You know, I think we all go through those types of feelings at times in our lives. We all do. You're not alone. If you're a little bit afraid, if you have some doubt, if you don't know what to do, you're not alone. We all go through these times, don't we? Sure we do. You may express them in faith and humility before God because as the saints before us have done again, 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 and again, they have experienced it. We see them. We know they had the same feelings. We have the same feelings. So we need to humble ourselves before God and tell Him how we feel. 
God will always, always accept and receive a soul bearing honesty from his people. If you will bear your soul before God, if you will humble yourself before him, he will hear you. He will hear you. God understands, and we must be willing to open our hearts to him. Why is that such a hard thing to do? Why is it so hard to open our hearts to God? Why? In verse 16, we find the justification. The justification for the pleas of verse 15. But you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us, or Israel acknowledge us, you, you Lord, are our father, our redeemer from of old is your name. So what is the basis for the expectation here? Why do they think that God should have feelings of affection and, and compassion toward them or, or even us today? Why do we think God, what is the reason that we think God should even care about us? Why should he even think about us? Why does God care about them and why does he care about us? It's because God is the one who brought them into existence. They were his children, just like I told you earlier. They were God's children, not because they wanted to be, but because God made them his children. He called them, and we too, you and I, we are God's children through our faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one. God took the action. His grace, his mercy was, comes from God, not from us. We don't deserve anything. We only accept what he, God Almighty, has given to us. What else can we do? You know, it is a solemn thought that they were and, and we are God's children. We are his spiritual children. That's what we're talking about here, brothers and sisters. We're talking about our spirituality, our spirits, our souls. We belong to God. Don't ever forget that. You belong to God. God's relation with his own is even deeper, deeper and the, and the, than any other relationship that you could have, whether it's with your mom, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your children, God's relationship with us is deeper than that. They emphasize the fact of their despairing action. And to emphasize the fact that God, that man, human help, would not help and could not help them. They reference Abraham, the father Abraham, and even Israel here. You see, the people at that time, they were so few and so weak that neither Abraham nor Israel would recognize them. They had gone so far from God. They experienced so much trouble. They were having things that they'd never gone through before that they knew if Abraham was there, he wouldn't know who they were. Israel would not know who they were. They couldn't recognize them, though Almighty uh, uh, God could. You see, Abraham might deny his children. He may not say, well, that's not my children. They're not obeying God. They are weak. But let me tell you, God cannot deny us, and he would not deny them. Hallelujah. You know why? He made us. God made you. God made you and me. He made you. He called you. Did you decide, oh, I think I'll go to God? No, God drew you. God made you. So it doesn't matter what you look like. God knows you. 
So you see right here, the appeal is not only to the fact that God made them or fathered them, brought them into existence, but also it appeals to his saving nature. <laughs> God is a merciful God. If he's God at all, he is a merciful God. Their hope was God's historical revelation of himself. He had revealed himself as their redeemer time and time and time again. Had he not? Sure he had. He had revealed himself as their redeemer. He, the words here says, our redeemer of from of old. Our redeemer from of old. By that name, we have come to know him. And once again, we want to know him. They're saying this. I'm going to paraphrase what they're saying, okay? They're saying, we have offended you, but we are still your children. We've wandered from you, but we are still your own, and we are bought with a price. You, your name, our Redeemer, is not a temporary name. Once we are redeemed by you, we are always redeemed by you. It is from everlasting to everlasting. Therefore, look, Lord God, on your poor people. Hallelujah. You redeem me, Lord. You redeem these who hear you. Lord God, you redeemed us. You made us. You know us. Hear our prayers. Hear us now. Come, Lord. Please come, Lord Jesus. Leave us not. Leave us not, or we perish, for we are poor and weak. We are humbled. We are not, Lord, strong enough. You, Lord, are our God. If God does not graciously, benevolently, and lovingly initiate action on our behalf, on all of us, then there's no hope for God's people. If he's not willing to do it, there is no hope. We can't do it ourselves. Government can't do it for us. We can't do it for each other. We can't do it for ourselves. Only God can save us. We are totally and completely under God's grace and God's eye. Amen? I should hear a resounding amen. That was pretty resounding. Number two, straying from the Father. Verse 17 begins revealing some tragic consequences of straying from God and His Word. It says, Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. As a people come to their senses, they start understanding, they start realizing, and they confess the failing of the human initiative to either desire the ways of God or to walk in them. In other words, because they're starting to come to good sense, the Holy Spirit's helping them understand, they realize, we need you, Lord. They realize they cannot break out of the pattern of sin on their own. We all get in ruts. We're all sinners. We all fail. We must have that desire so that God, so that God can take us out of this rot, rut. You see, they realize they cannot break out of the pattern of sin. Jesus said in John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up in the last days. Hallelujah. We can't go to God on our own. It's the Holy Spirit that draws us all. Without the enabling grace of God, we will stray from God's ways every time. 
And if we continue in our sin, our hearts will be hardened toward our sin. We get so used to the convicting of the Holy Spirit. We get so used to sin that our hearts get hardened toward God. Isaiah, in fact, he has seen the addictive power of sin and the stubbornness of rebellion. He has proclaimed God's word to God's people with all his strength. And he's watched them turn away in contempt. Today, many preachers and pastors go through the same thing. They declare the word of God. And the Holy Spirit convicts and still people turn away from God. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah 30. Back to Isaiah 30 for just, we're going to look at just a little bit here. Isaiah 39 through 14. 9 through 14, Isaiah 30, 9 through 14, please follow along as I read. These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message and relied on oppression and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. Amen. These are the children that Isaiah had to deal with. Israel, uh, Isaiah realizes that the only hope, the only hope is for God's power. God's power and God's affliction to change God's people. That was the only hope. Only God, only God can change the human's heart. We are so callous, we are so uncaring, that unless we can in some small way connect with the passion and the power of God, there is no hope for us. If we can't connect with God's love, if we can't connect with his care and compassion for us, then we have no hope because our hope is only in God Almighty. And his name is Jesus. We all need prayer. We need to intercede for each other. Intercession is the passionate entering into the needs of others and storming the gates of heaven with them until we can actually touch God spiritually and be changed by God. That's what intercession is. We intercede. We don't give up. We don't stop. We keep praying. Keep praying. Number three is the result, the results of fatherlessness. The earthly evidence of prolonged sin is that God's adversaries collapse the worship of God in his house. Verse 18 says, for a little while your people possess your holy place. But now our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary. Though what is talked about here probably is the literal destruction of the temple, it certainly symbolizes the entrance of enemies 
that trample down the worship that should be occurring in God's house. This is very important for us to think about this in these uncertain times, in these times of distress, in these times of not knowing what's happening. We must realize that if we don't enter God's house, the enemy will and will destroy our worship. Holy people should have a zeal for God's place of worship. If you belong to God, you should have a zeal for worshiping God in his house. I know the argument is you can worship God any place you want. I hear that. I know that. But if you have no zeal, you have no care, no desire to worship God with other worshipers and worship in his house, then I wonder, I wonder where is your zeal for God's house? Because all holy people have a zeal for God's place of worship. When it is lost, the adversary soon will stop worshipers from coming and stop the worshiping of God. It may be formal or informal. It may be loud or it may be quiet. But God's presence is not there because people, God's people, are not walking in his way and their hearts have become hardened to his voice. The sad results of walking according to the dictates of the hearts that are hardened are further revealed here in verse 19. We have become like those over whom you never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. Though the nation had belonged to God, they belonged to God for centuries. God is the one that brought them out of Egypt. God is the one that brought them to the promised land. God is the one who had blessed them. God is the one who made them. It had been a long time since the people were in a proper relationship with God and his rule over them. Even though God had done all that for them, they kept turning from him. There was now, according to this, this scripture, little or no difference between the corrupted religious services and character of God's supposed people than the religious services and the character of the people of the world, the non-believers. God says, I don't see any difference between you and the people over here who don't believe in me. God no longer made a, any significant difference in the church or in the hearts of the believers. Is that true today? Is that true of us today? Does God make a difference in us? Does he make a difference in us? Are we different from the unchurched? Are we different from the unbelievers? Are we children of God or not? That's the question. Do we belong to God? If we do, there should be a difference. Are we different? from the children of the devil? You either belong to God or you belong to the devil. There's no in between. Is there a difference between us and them? In conclusion, the state that I just talked about is a sad condition for the church of God to be in. 
And I'm concerned that it's getting into that condition now. That we are sinking to a level with the world. The church has been called to a higher standard. We've been called to a higher position. After all, aren't we God's children? Don't we belong to God? But many in the church are leaving that high calling. They're leaving it for different reasons and they have their excuses. But the truth is, the devil is drawing them to their sinful nature. They are quitting the path of being a separated people. We are called to be holy. We are called to be separated from the world. We may live in the world, and we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are different. Are you different? Then you should be worshiping God if you are. You should be giving Him glory. Are we different and becoming? Or are we like the world? Are we just like those that... Are we acting just like those that God never knew? And those that don't know God? And those who were never called by His name? Are we just like them? That's the question. And I think... The church today is in a pitiful situation. May God draw us to himself. Once more, may we find him and may we find his mercy and his grace to make us different from the world, to make us like Jesus. I want to be just like Jesus. I don't want to be like the world. I want to be like him, don't you? I plead with you. I ask you to open your heart to God and humble yourself before him so that he can help us because he will, because we're his children, and he will make us what he wants us to be for his holy namesake. Trust the Lord. No matter what's going on, trust the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, I lift up to you every soul that's here and every soul that hears my voice that may be watching us, Lord, wherever they may be, I lift them up to you. May your Holy Spirit, Lord, anoint us all. If it's conviction we need, then give us conviction. If it's joy we need, give us your joy. If it's courage we need, give us your courage. Whatever it is, Lord, take away our fear. Take away our doubt. Take away our sin. Lord, separate us from it as far as the east and the west is because of your namesake, because of the name of Jesus. Jesus, we believe that you are the Christ. You are the Lamb of God, but you're going to return, and you're going to return as King of kings and Lord of lords, and you're going to call your own. May we be called. May we be lifted up. We appeal to your mercy. We appeal to your grace. Lord, you're the one that called us out of this world. You're the one that made us your people. We call ourselves Christians. Because of you, Christ, Christ Jesus, you are our Lord and Savior. And maybe some people, Lord, have forgotten that. Maybe they are afraid of the world and they have fear in their hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'd give them courage and power right now. I pray, Lord, for them, Lord, that are listening. I pray, Lord, that you'd enter their hearts right now. Lord, I pray that you would give them strength and power to overcome whatever the world throws at us. Let us rejoice together. Let us worship you with one heart, one mind, one soul for your glory. Thank you, Lord. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen.